Actually, in fact, Britain is regressing, according to figures on poverty this month. So could there be something systemically wrong in the UK, and do the British public recognise it? Now Jeremy Corbyn is odds-on to replace Theresa May. Joining me now is Oxford University's Holford McKinder Chair, one of the world's greatest geographers, Professor Danny Dawling, whose new book, Peak Inequality, Britain's Ticking Time Bomb, is out now. Professor Danny Dawling, welcome back to Going Underground. So you trace the roots of why a relatively left-of-centre Labour Party uh, under Jeremy Corbyn now looking set to win the next election, is directly related to what you call peak inequality. What is peak inequality? Uh, peak inequality is when everything comes together. So the way we measure inequality is the gap between rich and poor in terms of income, and that would be getting wider and wider, and then the gap narrowed for people who weren't in the top 10%, but they carried on getting more, and then they lost out on top 1%, went up, and so on and so on and so on, until around about spring this year, spring 2018, when the highest paid person in Britain lost his job and we also had reports that bankers' pay was falling. So it's the peak of the income inequality gap, but at the same time, problems that are created by inequality, so problems like homelessness, have reached historic highs. 130,000 children are homeless at Christmas. That's the highest it's been for many, many years. Uh, death rates, death rates are now rising for the whole population by 5% in the last 12 months. These things rarely ever happen. The last time that happened was in wartime. And when you begin to get so many incredibly terrible statistics and you see that the very best of are stopped taking more because they can't take any more, it looks like a peak. It may not be a peak, but this is what a peak looks like. The last peak was 1913, so that's the only one we've got to go on. Uh, but the same kind of thing happened then. But you also tend to have a disaster around the time of a peak. Um, the obvious one then was the First World first War. World War. Um, Brexit is a much more benign disaster than the First World War, but it's just the kind of thing that makes a country poorer. And when you become poorer at this kind of extreme situation, the only place you can get the money from to keep going is the very rich. And that begins the kind of slide down towards becoming more normal and becoming more equal. I should say, of course, those who support Brexit would uh, disagree. It's going to make us uh, poorer. You say there's a myth going around in the British public life about uh, w who voted for Brexit. The myth is that it's the working class, the disaffected working class rose up and voted Leave. But only about a quarter of the Leave vote was social class D and E. The majority of the Leave vote was middle class ABC1. The majority was in the south of England. Uh, working class people were much more likely not to vote uh, whereas middle-class people, particularly older middle-class people, voted. And your typical Leave voter was a Conservative Tory voter who wasn't rich, but wasn't particularly poor, living in the south of England, who had watched, as far as they were concerned, and they're right, a country slowly fall apart, and their own children and their grandchildren being unable to buy homes, start a family. They'd done everything they'd been told to do, and yet they weren't looking at the rosy future they'd been promised in the 80s, in the 90s, and they were angry. So it's not the lost industrial jobs of the North at all. Just to remind our younger viewers, before we explore the issues by issues that you go in so, so clearly and coherently here, uh, you remind uh, readers that back in the 70s, Britain was not like this at all. It was approaching no. levels of equality yeah. uh, that are now present in Scandinavia. Britain, for large countries in Europe, around about 1976, Britain was the second most equal to Sweden. The gaps between rich and poor were the narrowest they'd been in the whole of the history of the British Isles. People could start a family in their 20s. Um, you could get a home. We had full employment, real full employment. You know, you could actually choose what job you wanted, not this fake full employment we have now, where you're sanctioned to death if you don't take any job that you can possibly find. Yeah, Theresa May often in pointing to those employment figures, but uh, of course even in mainstream media they're now talking about the working poor not even being able to afford houses. You uh, claim that the uh, Thatcher right to buy policy of being able to, uh, in effect, the privatization of, of council housing is one explanation of why fewer people now are starting to own homes. Yes. I mean, initially, right to buy was the biggest transfer of wealth that the poor had ever got in Britain, initially. But you bought your council house if you'd lived in it for some years with a discount. But then you sold it on to a private landlord. And that private landlord then charges a private rent rather than the council rent. Mm 
and you suddenly find that the country as a whole is in a much worse situation. So the consequences are the opposite of what Mrs Thatcher and yeah. the and arguable not intended, ideologues... Not, not intended. They really did want people locked in their houses, paying a mortgage, being well behaved. Um, very recently, it's now gone over a quarter of all families in England in ch with children have a private landlord, can be evicted with two months notice. This is a quarter of all families in England with kids going to school have no security that they can carry on living in that home they're in. At any time they can be told you've got two months and you've got to go. Okay, but you claim that um, Theresa May says that she's making all these announcements about housing and hmm. you're claiming that the 1.2 billion pounds is about the price of a long street in Chelsea in the rich part of London. Yeah. If we are at the peak of inequality and your political parties all begin to step to the left, uh, you could imagine getting into a situation in 20 or 30 years' time when a right-wing government tries to build more social housing than Labour. And that is exactly what happened 20 or 30 years after the last peak. Um, the Macmillan actually managed to build more decent quality free bed big council houses um, than the 1945 Labour government had done. Of course, uh, another way to look at it would be that um, peak inequality could mean a uh, rise of the far right, mm. and immigration is certainly debated non-stop on our screens in relation yeah. to the Brexit debate. You appear to correlate lower rates of immigration to Britain with falling GDP growth. How do you arrive at that? If you look at immigration over the last century, human beings move all around the planet uh, trying to stop them doesn't work. Immigration controls are incredibly ineffective. What stops people coming or staying is if there are no jobs, they don't come. So the poor parts of Britain don't have immigrants. Um, but also, if you have a more equal society, which means fewer jobs at the bottom, you get less immigrants. On health care, you say the worst record, Cameron and May have the worst records of any uh, post-war prime ministers. No, the, the health care... Uh, crisis is unbelievable. It's the cut in social care is the most devastating. Half of all those adult social workers who used to turn up for half an hour at a frail elderly person's house once a week just to check that they hadn't fallen to the bottom of the stairs, those jobs are gone. Meals on Wheels are no longer being delivered. Um, I mean, it's... And a really odd thing about it is that the biggest effect has been on people in their 80s and late 70s. And this group will be majority middle class to live that long. The majority of them probably voted Conservative in 79 and 83 and 87. And the bulk of the premature deaths that have happened to date, this is at least 120,000 deaths brought forward, has actually occurred to elderly people who had swallowed during their middle age the idea that you vote for the market and laissez-faire and everything will be good. And they're the ones dying earlier and dying earlier than people elsewhere in, in Europe. And it's just, it's not just the poor who are being affected by this. This is affecting everybody. The, in, the infant mortality rate for the whole population is now going up. Five years ago, it was just for babies with mums who were from working class. Now it's everybody. And this is what happens at the peak. You, you know, there were things I used to complain about five years ago and say this is terrible. You know, elderly women were losing five and a half weeks of life expectancy and I came out and said, you can't believe this, it hasn't happened. That's nothing compared to what's happening today. So just, just finally, uh, you say you compare the new Labour, Blairite and Tory policies to if they were uh, a, a medical trial, they'd be mm. stopped on, on uh, ethical grounds. You compare inequality policies to terrorism, since you happen to be mentioning deaths. Mm. Well... In your thought experiments that are at the end of the book. In the thought, I mean, the last section of the book um, tries to look back on today for imagining a hundred years in the future. Because if you're swept up in it, if you're in it now, it's very easy to say nothing can change much. Um, you know, the rich will hold on to what they've got. If you look back at 1918 and look at just how much changed so quickly from 100 years ago, you can see that change is actually normal. Change is what we should expect. What you have to ask is what will people look at in the future that we're doing now and say they didn't realise how inhuman uh, that was. And I'm not really trying to guess the future because you can't do that. I'm using examples from other countries that are ahead of us in time, if you like, and they get better results, but also their children are happier and their mental health is happier. And I also get to look at what we're doing now, which I suspect will be seen as, as ridiculous in the future. And at the heights of inequality, countries do 
the most ridiculous things, and, and it's worrying. I mean, the, the big rise in inequality in Germany was in the 1930s. Uh, you know, so inequality rises are not necessarily good news. They can lead to fascist governments. But the, and the other kind of bad news is, after the peak, it normally takes 20 years before you even notice things getting better. It's not a sudden nirvana. You know, it is just you're no longer seeing the rich taking more and more. But you don't suddenly see life improve for everybody. It's, it's the bad news is it's a very slow process going down the slope again. Professor Danny Dorling, thank you. Thank you. After the break.